It's wonderful to see you here uh, this morning as we worship Jesus Christ and celebrate his name. And I, I want, first of all, to say uh, welcome home to a couple folks that have been gone for a while. And, and we're glad to see them back home where they can serve God here in Rabbit Creek. Ben and Lane Lee, would you please stand up for a minute? Ben and Lane have, have been serving overseas, reaching out in the name of Christ uh, to people of other faith, and we are so thankful that they're given the opportunity to do that, and we are thankful that God has brought them home where they can do that here as well, along with us, so welcome back. Thanks for having us, and thanks for being here with us. I want to take you back into May of 2011. May 2011, a man named Mitch Daniels, at the time governor, he, he said that he would not pursue the presidential primary. He's now president of Purdue University. At the time, however, he was governor, and he was encouraged by many to pursue the presidential primary, and he declined that. There's another man, and Himmelman's his last name, Pat Himmelman, and he is Bob Dylan's son-in-law. And he, he decided that he would limit his touring, and thus he limited his fan base. And I want you to hear from their words, their own words, why they chose. Why give up the opportunity to possibly be the commander in chief? Why give up the opportunity to possibly have a very large fan base? Well, again, hear this in their own words. Daniel says this, I will not be a candidate. Simply put, I find myself caught between two duties. I love my country, I love my family more. Himmelman, in my priority list right ahead of becoming a rich, famous rock star was becoming a good husband and a father. It really helps me to know that I have things, values that simply cannot be purchased. And so again, I ask you, why would a man give up the pursuit of being commander in chief of this great nation? And why would a man give up the opportunity to have his name known all over the place? One word, family. They both made the commitment that Daniels didn't want to drag his family to all the public exposure where they dig everything out and bring it to the public forum. Himmelman did not want to be away from his children for extended amounts of time, and so he said, I'm going to limit where I tour. And so on this day where we ultimately give Jesus Christ honor and glory, we also take some time to acknowledge the importance of fathers. It has often been the case, unfortunately, that in May, uh, churches gather together and celebrate Mother's Day and give encouragement, and then they get to June for Father's Day, and, and they do a little different message, something that goes like this. Mothers, great job, keep it up. Men, get it together. <laughs> Hasn't that always been the case? Mothers get applauded, fathers get chewed out. I, I don't think that soft pedaling is a good thing, and I also don't think that strong arming is a good thing. And I, I don't want to come up and, and talk in platitudes and lift fathers higher than we need to be lifted, but I also don't want us to take a father and, and beat him down. And so I say, what is the best source where we can find words to fathers? Words of encouragement, words of correction, yes, but also words of motivation. Well, I hold it in my hand. Scripture. And I want us to look into a man's life, and this man, like Daniels and like, like Himmelman, decided that above all else, that he would stick to what we're going to call the three greatest loves of his life. He decided that he would be a man of love. You're going to know this story, and you often perhaps don't hear it in the middle of a sunny day in June, but I do invite you to go to what we call the Christmas story. Matthew chapter 1, beginning in verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be the child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. So that day engagement was legally binding, that's why it says divorce. 
Verse 20, but after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. Chapter 2, verse 13. A couple years later after what we just read. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and left Egypt where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so fulfilled what the Lord had said to the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. When Herod realized that he'd been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Verse 19, again a little bit later. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who are trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was re reigning in, Jude in Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. And he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So was fulfilled what was said to the prophets. He will be called a Nazarene. Now in comparison to many other characters in Scripture, Joseph gets very little press. But in these verses that I've read, we find that Joseph had some priorities and some priorities that he stuck to. He budged not when it came to these priorities or what I'm calling his three loves. And, and fathers, I want you to look at Joseph's life and say, are these three loves a part of my life? Am I committed to these loves? Women, men, not fathers, all of you need to have these loves to one extent or another as well. But what we see, first of all, is that Joseph loved God. Joseph loved God. Priority number one in Joseph's life was loving God. Matthew refers to him as a righteous man. The kaios is the Greek word there. And you go to the root word and then the root word of that root word, and you find out that what righteous means is to show and exposed to the eyes. So the root word of righteousness is to show or expose to the eyes. And so do you understand what that means? That I mean, righteousness means that I, I illuminate, I exhibit, I show people who God is and what he is about. Now that should be our prayer, fathers, and that should be your prayer, each follower of Christ, that when people look upon you, that you would expose, that you would enlighten people and say, wow, this is righteousness. This is righteousness. That's why Jesus says we are to be the light of the world. And that applies to you as a father. And the closest people to you, your wife and your children, are looking at you and asking themselves, is this man a man of God? Is this man one who exhibits righteousness? Is my husband a righteous man? Are my children seeing a righteous man when they look upon me? Now, we all know we're not going to be perfect at this. So what's the remedy to that? The remedy to that is get this priority straight. Love God above all else. Do you hear Jesus on this? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Fathers, that includes us, that we would love the Lord our God. I want you to pick up a few phrases with me out of Matthew that point to the fact that Joseph loved God. First, going back in chapter 1, verse 24 of Matthew, it says this about him. He did what the angel commanded. And this little tidbit in there in Matthew, which may not sound too significant, but I love it. It says, when he woke up, what's that tell you? It means that instantly, 
Joseph had this dream, and when he woke up, he got right to it. Now, how many of us do that? Some of us push pause at that moment. Or, or uh, what's the word I don't use? Snooze, thank you. I don't like snooze. That's why I can't think of it. It drives me crazy. Uh, but, but people push snooze often in their lives. God says, get up and do this. And we want to push snooze and say, well, God, maybe later. Give me five more minutes. Give me two more years. Give me five more years. Let me wait till my children are out of the house. Let me wait until I've graduated. Let me wait until I've got the right education, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Snooze, 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 snooze. What Matthew 1 tells us is he did what God commanded right when he got up. Jumped out of bed, did what God told him to do. Matthew chapter 2, and, and tw twice in verse 14 and verse 21, it says, so he got up. This is where he is instructed to be a protector of his family. And God says, do it, and he does it. He got up. He didn't sit and wait. He didn't ask for more evidence. He didn't ask for more proof. He didn't seek more motivation. He heard the voice of God, and he got up. The gospel writer Luke adds to this. We go back in time, back to just around his birth. And in chapter 2 of Luke, we re read these words. Verse 22. Luke chapter 2. When the time of their purification, this is 33 days after the circumcision of Jesus, by the way. When the time of their purification, according to the law of Moses, had been completed, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of young doves, of young pigeons, and then in verse 39, when Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and, and the grace of God was upon him. Every year, his parents went to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. Some other things we see in Luke about Joseph. In Luke chapter 2, verse 22, he obeyed the law of God. Shouldn't that be the example we set, fathers? That we obey the scriptures, that we obey what God calls us to do, that we obey the law. Verse 39 says he followed everything required by the law. And then in verse 41, it says this, that they, he and Mary, celebrated the Passover every year. Fathers, what Passover was is the great celebration of the passing over of the death angel before they left Egypt and went into, and went across the Red Sea and eventually into the promised land. And that God said, if you will take the lamb's blood and put it over the door frames of your house, the death angel will pass over and all the firstborn of the Egyptians will die, but your firstborn will not die. And this is the great Passover. And even today, Jews continue to celebrate this great feast and this great celebration. Translation for us. What do we celebrate every Sunday morning? The resurrection and power of Jesus Christ. Translation, verse 41 says, every year they celebrate a Passover. Fathers, here's what it should say to you. Every Sunday you brought your child and your wife to church. That's what verse 41 says to you. Every Sunday you bring your child and your spouse to church. You see, that's what happens when we come to, in the, in the old day, when they came into Jerusalem, thousands and thousands of people, enthusiasm spread. Maybe someday they didn't feel like going to Passover, but guess what? They went to Passover, and the energy that exuded there encouraged them, and it was addictive in the great sense that here was another family enjoying, Pass enjoying Passover, so now they're enjoying Passover, and this happens to us when we go to church. You may not feel like going to church, but then you go to church, and the people around you are enjoying being there, so hopefully you start enjoying a little bit too. And so, Father, it's your responsibility, as it says in Scripture, is to be a spiritual leader of your family. And so it's your responsibility, not your wife's responsibility, not your child's responsibility. It is your responsibility to bring your family to church and celebrate, do as God says. Fathers, your first love must be God. And we are going to talk about two other loves, but if you do not have this first love in order, these other two are not going to be lived out to their full potential. And I want you to hear that. Because, man, if you're a father here today and you do not love the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you will never be the complete husband. You will never be the complete father. Because we understand that we love 
and we learn to love because God first loved us. We simply cannot be the husbands or the fathers we need to be unless we love God first and foremost. And so I push pause there a minute and say, men, if you're fathers and you don't know Lord Jesus Christ, commit to him today. And you will be amazed how much more you love your wife and how much more you love your children because you know that God loves you. Be a part of that. Joseph loved God. Joseph loved Mary. Joseph loved Mary. Now, you, you got to give J Joseph the benefit of the doubt. He's engaged to Mary, and he's obviously going to marry her, and she shows up and says, Honey, I'm pregnant. What would you think? We know what he thought. But notice what the Scripture says. He sought no harm. He sought no revenge. He didn't want to cause any trouble in her life. And so therefore, he wanted to what? Divorce her quietly. I'm a righteous man, he says. God says it about him, rather. And he says, okay, Mary, you've hurt me. You've disappointed me. But what's this quietly get out of this engagement? He could have done much worse. Her life could have been in danger. Her reputation could have been much more in danger than it was already. And he said, let me just quietly divorce her. And the God, then God gives him grace and mercy and says, well, hold on, Joseph, let me explain. The Spirit of God is the one that brought this child into her womb. And so do not be afraid. He wished her no harm. Now, husbands, that is a miracle that is only happening one time. And so we're not going to experience exactly what Joseph experienced, but I do want us to hear an example of how to love your wife in such a manner. Uh, yesterday I stood about in this spot, and a man and a woman exchanged vows, promising to love one another. Following that wedding, went right into my study and had some counseling with a couple who's going to be married. And so what we did there is we exchanged vows and then talked to people about what vows meant. And to husbands, there's a word in Ephesians that is so profound. And listen to these words in Ephesians chapter 5, beginning in verse 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with holy water, with, with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds and cares for it, just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Now, I see what happened there with Paul. You see, he, I want you to picture the high jump. And there's a man named Fosbury that came up with the Fosbury flop. Before the Fosbury flop, they jumped just standing up. And then he decided, hey, if I go backwards, I might jump higher. And sure enough, he did. And everybody does the Fosbury flop now. I, I, I want to propose to you that here we see the bar raised from here to keep going up. You see, what does the scripture say? It doesn't say... Love your wives as you feel like it. It doesn't say love your wives as the, the best husband you pick out does. It says love your wives as Christ loved the church. Okay, this is not rhetorical. What did Christ do for the church? <laughs> Died for the church. Okay, fill in the blank. Husbands, love your wives as Christ died for the church. That is total sacrifice. So often we get hung up on the previous verses telling women what they need to do. Husbands, listen to what it says to you. Love your wives as Christ loved the church. Be like Joseph who did not, did not want to harm Mary at all. And then later after they are married, he above all else after loving God takes care of his wife Mary. He learns how to love Mary 
by loving God first. Again, husbands, father or not, love your wives, you will fail. But God will lift you up and give you strength to do that which he has commanded you to do. I said there's three loves. Well, guess what? Joseph loved God, Joseph loved Mary, and Joseph loved Jesus. Christians loved Jesus as Lord and Savior. Joseph loved Jesus before the world knew who he was. And he took upon this adopted child, if you will, not flesh of his flesh, but God's child. And Joseph, as I said, doesn't receive much press, but the press he does receive tells us that he obeyed God and took care of his son, of God's son and of Joseph's son. You, you see this picture behind me, this painting, and I, I love this image here of Hornthurst, Hornthurst work, the childhood of Christ. And, and you see what Joseph is doing as Jesus holds the candlelight is he is taking the carpenter's trade and training his son. Now, we don't know exactly how that worked out in Scripture, but we do know that what Joseph did was pass on his trade to his son. And I want you to think about the patience. How many of how many you fathers, go ahead and raise your hand. Have you ever tried to teach your child how to do something? Raise your hand if it's never been frustrating. <laughs> I didn't see any hand. Just use your imagination here. Use your imagination. I know Jesus was without sin. The Bible makes that clear, but it doesn't mean he didn't frustrate Joseph. And Joseph had to have patience, and he loved his son, and he took care of his son, and he was gentle with his son, and he encouraged his son, and said something like, son, that's not exactly how you should angle that wood. And that's not exactly what I meant when I said, make this stool. But let me show you how it's done. He encourages him, and I, it is no accident that the Bible says that Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature. Chapter 2, verse 40. And the child grew and became strong and was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. That follows directly after verse 39, obviously, and that's important. The placement of verses are very, is very important. And that comes right afterwards of how Joseph took care of his family. And it goes right into verse 40 and says, well, I believe, therefore, in other words, because of what he did and because of the grace of God, Jesus grew and became strong. You see, Jesus, as we find out later, for example, did not know when he would return. He says only the Father knows that. And so we take from that that Jesus, because, as Philippians 2 says, even though he's equal to God, considered equality with God something not to be grasped, he, he gave up portion of his divinity. He continued to be God, but he gave up some of his divine power so that he was weak in flesh, as Philippians 2 says, and therefore he did not know everything that he knows. Does that make sense? He limited himself while on earth. And so we know, guess what, that he had to learn. Do you ever get that? He had to learn to read and write. Guess who taught him? And he had to learn the book that he wrote. I love this. It's the Word of God. He wrote it, but then he had to learn it as a child. He grew in wisdom. It's not like a zap. He understood this. He was taught. I want you to listen to a prayer. Walter Bowie wrote it in 1939. So it's a little aged, if you will, but nothing wrong with that. He's a, he's a minister and a theologian and a father. And he sought God's wisdom on how to be a father and listen to his prayer. And I invite you fathers to take example of this prayer. And if you'd like it later, I'll send it to you. Just let me know. O oh God, who art our father, take my human fatherhood and bless it with thy spirit. Let me not fail this little son of mine. Help me to know what thou wouldst make of him and use me to help and bless him. Make me loving and understanding, cheerful and patient and sensitive to all his needs so that he may trust me enough to come close to me and let me come very close to him. Make me ashamed to demand of him what I do not demand of myself, but help me more and more to try to be the kind of man that he might pattern after. And this I ask in the name and by the grace of Christ. Amen. What a wonderful prayer that we would say as fathers, God, would you help me to love my son as you have loved me? And Father, would you help me to be the father 
that is so loving that my child, my son, or my daughter is not afraid to come near me, near to my embrace, near to my encouragement, near to my love. And I love the line where he says, may I be ashamed of asking him to do and expecting of him what I do not expect of himself. Never let it be said and never say to your child, do as I say and not as I do. Because guess what? They pay a whole lot more attention to what you do than what you say. And so do not expect of your children more than you expect of yourself. Live that. Model that. Be that example. Now I often say, okay, how do we do this? And I came across some words from Dan Bolin, some suggestions on how to love your father or love your children as a father. And I want you to listen to these. He says... Our daughters need us to teach them what true love and affection really are so that they'll be able to recognize the counterfeits when they appear. Hold on to that. They need to know that they are special. This can happen only as they become a priority in our lives. We have a responsibility to protect, direct, and correct. Write those words down, fathers. Protect, direct, and correct. Protect, correct, and direct their lives and do it in the most loving, strong, and joyful manner possible. Here's some suggestions he gives. Kiss her mother in her presence. I love that one. Leave her a note or present where she will find it when you're out of town or not home when she goes to sleep. Compliment her character and skill three times for every one compliment on her appearance. Hold her when she cries. Tell her Bible stories. Look through a clothing catalog and explain to her what is becoming on a young lady and what is not. Pray, me, pray for her future husband. Help her clean her room. And give her a child's Bible with her name on it. And suggestions of how to father your son. Tell him stories about yourself when you were his age. Hold on, your seatbelt's on this one. Admit you were wrong and apologize. Work together to wash the car and then his bike. Write your son a letter telling him the things he does well and the positive character traits you see in him. Hug and love his mother. Look at him when he is talking. Choose a service project you're both interested in to work on with your son. Give him an allowance that is dependent on his completion of assigned chores around the house. Help coach his baseball team. Tell him, I love you as often as he can stand it. Great suggestions. Again, I'll give those to you if you want. But great ways for you to say practically here is how I love my daughter. Here is how I love my son. I want you to pay attention to the order in which I placed these three loves. They are in intentional order and correct order. Bottom line is your love for your wife grows proportionally to the love of God. And you will not, as I said, be the father you need to be, nor the husband you can be, unless you love God. I can tell you that what so often happens in in even good-meaning fathers is somewhere along the way they can get these out of order. And perhaps they put God down below and they say, I I can handle this on my own, God. Church is for my kids and my wife, but certainly not for me. Don't let that happen. Or there's one that maybe sound good on the surface, but it certainly isn't. The kids start coming first. Fathers, don't let that happen. Never love your children more than you love your wife. Love your wife because guess what? At some point, <laughs> unless they keep coming back, <laughs> your children are no longer going to be in your house. And guess who's going to wake up next to you each morning? 18 years later, you need to know who that woman is. You need to know what she likes, what she doesn't like. You need to know how to love her, how to listen to her, how to care for her. And so listen to me carefully. Listen to the order. Pay attention to it. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. Guess who are your closest neighbors? First of all, the one you became one with. Your wife. And then your children. Love your God. Love your wife. Love your children. 
We've been hearing testimonies because we've been talking about Luke chapter 9, verse 23. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. I think one of the best ways, men, that we can deny ourselves is by loving God, loving our wives, and loving our children. And I said, what better way than to hear from a man who's got a little experience? Mark Vincent, most of you know him. He's a father of, guess this, five daughters. Um, so he comes with some experience. And uh, Mark, would you come up and uh, share your journey as a father? Let's give a word of thanks to Mark. Well, just as that, uh, that song we sang, How He Loves Us, uh, couldn't help but make me, uh, I want to get this out right now, I love you guys, just like he loves us, and uh, that's really important. Usually I get to just tell one or two of you, maybe 10 or 15 of you every Sunday, but not all of you at the same time, so that's awesome. Um, let me pray just real quickly, just real quickly, uh, Lord. It's no accident the Holy Spirit is present here today, and I just pray that uh, everybody here recognizes this after what Mark has shared and what uh, I'm looking forward to sharing. In your son's name, amen. Mark and I did not get together, but there's a lot of bullet points that are touched that I scribbled down. I usually don't let anybody proofread my stuff because it gets torn up and rewritten so much that I, it's not me anymore. So some of this stuff could be uh, misspelled or something and I might even read it wrong. But, uh, when Pastor Mark asked me to share this weekend, my immediate response was no. <laughs> of course he threw in the pray about it and let me know later. And our God, my God, is not going to miss out on an opportunity to humble me and push me outside of my comfort zone. So I already knew the answer before I even went to prayer. There, there are much better dads here, much smarter dads, much more dedicated dads, and even dads here that take their job as a father very serious. So there was some humor in there, but that's okay. So after a good amount of thought, and prayer, it didn't seem quite so ridiculous to me. You see, I could very well be the richest man here. And you may need to hear my explanation to that arrogance. Most of you know me or who I am. I'm Mark Vincent, by the way. Or where I am. But let me tell you a little bit about how I got here. I came from a broken home, an only son, who was constantly trying to prove himself to a loving, rugged, outdoorsman and part-time father. There should be violin music going on right now, but... Uh, <laughs> I would do anything to gain his approval. I had little hope of ever outperforming him in the outdoors or the construction world. He was honing his skills at the same time that I was. My efforts to make him proud turned into a one-man competition with myself. It was this mentality that gave me a distorted view of fatherhood and a confused idea of what being a parent was. So acceptance did become a part, a big part of who I am today. I would pay attention to other dads and their interaction with their sons. I can't help but be reminded of uh, my first pine car derby race in Cub Scouts. Uh, it didn't come out, turn out very well for me. I had developed a preconceived ideas of what a normal relationship should look like. Meals around the table, uh, weekend camping trips to Disney vacations. The leave it, leave it to Beaver type family. My life was probably more like Beaver than I care to admit. I look back now though and realize that I didn't miss much. My dad loved me, he was my best friend. We laughed, we cried. We laughed until we cried. He, he left me a legacy. He left me in a place ripe for growth and ready for fatherhood. So bear with me now because in this rant somewhere as I make a change and it's for the better. So I've been a dad for 29 years. I'm responsible for five daughters. All right, Brenda, you get some credit for that too. 
Uh, Amber, the oldest, was, has given me three granddaughters, uh, all of who seek after God. Aubrey, one of the twins, which she hates being called, is married to a, hates being called twin, is, is uh, married to a, Justin, a fantastic God-fearing man. They have two young baby girls who will someday grow up to know Christ. Brittany is uh, the other twin, when she hates to be called a twin. Uh, she often pushes me to climb mountains and, and uh, chase after elusive king salmon, or once in a while challenge me to a bike race, which she never wins. And uh, Darby, who often thinks I overreact, is preparing for a long-term mission trip right, uh, starting this fall. And Carly is just returning from a short-term mission trip. This, uh, she's in Amarillo right now. And uh, she doesn't mind helping me clean ducks, even in her high heels. And of course, I have a superhuman, super stubborn, super special wife, Brenda. Well, I can't believe I just said that. So, how does that all equate? Uh, a lot of estrogen. So, we talked about experience, of course, and what can I tell you about being a dad? Well, it seems the easiest job to get and the toughest job to do right. And after 20 plus years of teenage drama, I've seen all 87 reasons to cry. <laughs> there are even more uses of toilet paper. So hint, hide your own if uh, you're dwelling with six or more females. I've yanked enough cars out of the snowbank to warrant buying a tow truck. I hit a cord with one of my daughters. Uh, the most uh, common phrases in our house are such as, my tire's flat, I'm out of gas, I'm stuck, Dad, my car is making weird noises, you mean, to have, you, you, mean you have to check the oil? <laughs> and last but not least, honey, I told you not to buy that car. <laughs> so there's probably a whole day's worth of discussion on the merits of teenage driving alone. And we haven't even touched the subject of boyfriends. Oddly enough, I haven't met many, even, even though I've made it clear I would like to spend some one-on-one -on -one time hunting with them. <laughs> so in addition to teaching my kids how to patch a sinking boat with a sock, or in, case, in this case, socks, and why you should not use an outboard motor as a flotation device, I've taught them how many pounds of potatoes you should carry on a five-mile hike. Answer is none. And let's not forget how hard it is to steer a truck without a steering wheel. But in all seriousness, seven is too many for one canoe. Trust me. I, I tried to teach honesty, hard work, and selflessness. I can't help but try to say that ten times, selflessness, selflessness. It, it became clear to me that I was obsessed with, the, with these qualities, good ones they may be. I would beat myself up when one of the kids stole or borrowed the other's clothes. Or one might call me from the other room, on the phone, mind you, lazy. And on the subject of honesty, well, I just quit asking questions I didn't know the answer to, and now I've got them all fooled. I did try to make them come to church. That didn't work. I tried to dictate who their friends were. That didn't work. After a while, I threw up my hands in defeat and said, it's in your hands, God. He said, I know. I said, I know you know. <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't that he didn't want me to stop trying. He just wanted me to stop taking credit for any successes. I learned that if I wanted my kids to achieve wisdom, knowledge, and patience, and understanding, I was going to have to seek those out myself. They may not listen to me about cars, school, or the evil mini-me of men, aka boys. They did seem to mimic my love for Christ, my efforts to be transparent, my desire for an identity in Christ, blatant and obvious to all. The more I worked on my relationship with God, the closer I would get to God, the closer they would get. So no more do as I say philosophy, do as I do. The point of this is my kids are wanting to serve God now. 
Their names are written in the Lamb's Holy Book of Life, as well as mine, my wife, my sisters, my son-in-law, my brother-in-laws, and my cousins. The more my identity in Christ is, the more my children's identity in Christ is. With five daughters, five granddaughters, three sisters, one wife, you might say, you poor man. <laughs> but I say, on the contrary, I'm the richest man here. My treasures are stored up in heaven, and I will spend eternity with them. I'm extremely proud of them, and the two I see here today are my favorite today. So, <laughs> so anyways, it's, it's, uh, it's a joy being a part of your family, and uh, I just uh, encourage you guys to follow God, and if uh, you get out of control and things don't work the way you think they should work, then, then trust in God because kids will follow right behind you, just as Mark was t talking about. Thanks. Wow, thank you, Mark. Wonderful. Uh, you mentioned your father uh, and you laughing till you cried. You got me laughing till I cried as well. Um, a lot of great truth in there as well, so thank you for that. I'm glad I asked. 